means beginnings. So it's the it's the easiest place to find your Bible right after you uh, go through all the extra stuff people added. Then you get to the Bible. The first book of Moses is called Genesis. That's how it's labeled in my scripture. My copy, Genesis chapter 1. I'll read a few verses in chapter 1 and chapter 2. I want to preach probably a very simple very short message this evening that I think also is pertinent and has the answers to a lot of the problems that we're facing in our world today. Verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He him. Male and female created He them. Verse 7 of chapter 2, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Verse 20 of chapter 2, and Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found in help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And then follows the description of the marriage union. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Well, we'll pray tonight and get to the crux or the point of the message. Father, we do need your help this evening. I need your help, God, to be sensitive as well as just to be blunt and direct. And so I pray that in the way that only your spirit could do, you would enable me as a person who just is, is in great need of grace to be able to accomplish those tasks. And I pray that you would help us all to have hearts that want truth and that seek and desire to know, uh, God, how to respond to circumstances in our lives that we're facing even today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a passage of Scripture that really is probably one of the most important foundations for faith for any person. I mean, ultimately, if you accept that God created the earth, God created everything in it, and you accept that God created man, and created man as the Scripture says God created him, or you reject that altogether. The truth of the matter is, is that if you accept it, we've got a lot of common ground here and we can come to a common understanding. If you reject it, the fact is is that um, we probably can't agree on much of anything, especially spiritually, but pretty much even philosophically. Uh, and that's just a fact. In other words, our origin, where we came from, where man, mankind came from, really has all the answers for us, or it has no answer for us. And... This, the, the creation story distinguishes the creation account it distinguishes between God's creation, the heaven and the earth, and the way that God formed the heaven and the earth and the state it was in before the fall. And it distinguishes the creation of the animals and the fish of the sea and the heavens and all those things from one being that God made in His image, and that being is referred to in the plural, them. That is, man and woman, and God made them distinct from the rest of the beasts of the field and the animals in that He made them in His image. We see in chapter 2 that God breathed into Adam the uh, breath of life. Man became a living soul. I've only had to do CPR one time in my life. It was not uh, an experience I would ever want to have to repeat. We had a little boy 
uh, in uh, West Park Baptist, we had a pool, and we had kids who weren't allowed to swim in the pool because they hadn't gone through training yet. A little boy that was there on his first day in camp, and he came running out of the locker room and dove into the pool head first and never swam before, went straight to the bottom. And uh, the mechanism in him, in his body, just had him instantly stop breathing. We saw him go in, so we got him out instantly, but he stopped breathing, and I had to do CPR on him briefly, and uh, then everything was okay. He ended up spending the night in the hospital. And everything worked out very well. But when I see the phrase in the Scripture, God breathed in His nostrils the breath of life, uh, I think of that. I think of that moment. I, uh, You know, <laughs> that poem that I hate um, about creation, you know what I'm talking about? God said I'm lonely. You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody here else hate that besides me? God made the world just because He was lonely. Uh, I mean, it just to me it makes God's purpose and His plan is who He is. It just makes Him so... Oh, bored. <laughs> you know, let's just create a cosmic chaos, you know, for fun. You know, I mean, really, no. Okay, so, you know, I've heard people, you know, do the poem, and then they have something like, where they do the breathing. Well, this is a very intimate, personal thing where God breathes in the nostrils of man, the breath of life. It's a very up close, a personal, a personal thing. What was that? Wow. Okay. Um, anyway, and what God did was very, very personal, and it was very, very different. We don't see this with any of the animals. This is a, um, you could say a precious. You could call it a lot of things, but this is unique. That God made man, first of all, in His image. What does God look like? What does God look like? We're made in His image. Uh, this is not the point this evening, but I appreciate the description of the Scripture of Jesus. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. God's character, God's holy nature, and so forth, that's the predominant thing. It's not this, you know, He's this, got this you know, Greek features or something that would make a great physique or a model or a simpering sissy picture on a cross if you're going to make, you know, paint a picture of Jesus. Now, Jesus, the beauty of Jesus Christ is not in His features. And so you say, well, that's yeah, good because when I looked in the mirror and saw I was made in the image of God, I th okay, all right. Anyway, my point being this evening, we, you are what God looks like. You're made in God's image. I understand the theological significance of that. In other words, uh, God doesn't necessarily have my features or your features. He certainly, we we he would be look like a man, or we would look like God. You should say, uh, in the his actual form. Um, the reason that that is significant, though, is because of the fellowship issue. God made man in His image. God made man in His likeness because God fellowship with man. We see instances in the Scripture of inanimate objects' ability to worship God. In other words, you know what the Bible says, if man would not worship God, what would happen? Okay, rocks would cry out. This morning in our text in Matthew, Jesus, or I mean John the Baptist told the Pharisees and Sadducees, He said, don't think because you're children of Abraham. You know, God's going to let you off about this non-repentance thing. God's able to raise up of rocks the children of Abraham. It's the kind of nature, character God has. Or rocks aren't special. Animals aren't special. Uh, and for sake of getting off too far and being silly, I don't want to talk about that. But animals don't go to heaven. Man does. Animals aren't made in the image of God. God, the man is. There's a distinct difference between those. You say, Pastor, I believe animals go to heaven. Well, you're wrong. But um, animals don't go to heaven. They don't have eternal souls the way that you and I do. You say, could God, could God, you know, resurrect my dog and put him in heaven? Um, it wouldn't be heaven if your dog were there. So no, 
God wouldn't do that to us. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's enough being silly. Now let's be serious. We're made in, in the image of God, aren't we? Isn't it so? Yeah. That's precious. It's a distinct truth. And in that creation, in those statements about creation, we find really man's purpose. Why did God make man in His image? To glorify Him. To love Him. To worship Him. To fellowship with Him. It's what we're created for. It's amazing, isn't it? Is it not incredible that you and I were created by God, the prize of all His beautiful creation, distinct from everything else for the express purpose of fellowship, of worship. Doctrinally, God provided for man in the event of the fall. Jesus Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. So God didn't irresponsibly create man and then that turned out to be a disaster and now He's going to come up with something. God created man knowing all things. Ultimately that His Son would die for man. Can you imagine making a creation knowing the plan of redemption? You think the plan of redemption occurred to God post-fall or previous to the fall? When God created man, the redemption plan was in place. It's incredible. Many times I say to people, God loves you so much that if you comprehended everything the Bible said about it, you still wouldn't even grasp the beginning of how much God loves you. You have worth and value that is inestimable, humanly speaking. And the only way you can quantify your worth or your value is simply to look at God's investment in you. What's a drop of the blood of Jesus worth? What's the value of the blood of Jesus? What billionaire would not give every penny Every asset for a drop of the blood of Jesus, God's Son. And when God made man, He planned on that blood being shed. It's incredible. It's incredible how much God loves you. It's amazing. For people that struggle with esteem, esteem of others, esteem of self, always urge them to find their worth or their value in what God values them at. For people who struggle loving others, they struggle knowing how to love people as much as they love themselves, I urge them to learn to value people the way God values people. Ask yourself the question the next time you have a hard time loving someone, how much God loves them? And how much God has invested in them? How valuable is that person to God? Is there anything that would be too much for us if God gave His Son for that person? Would there be a step that would be too far? Would there be a line that we could not cross? When Christ's blood was shed because of God's value for us, on the other side of the self-esteem or the esteem of others, how do you value yourself in comparison with how God values you? <coughs> I tell people all the time, you don't need to have a high self-esteem. You don't have to believe something about yourself. If you do, you're believing a lie. That's not said to be mean. It's just a fact. If you think that your worth is because of something that you are in your flesh or something you have achieved in your intellect or in your talent level, my friend, that's not much, especially compared with me. 
joking. You smile real quickly. It's not much because of the way God loves you. Isn't it so? God loves you so much that whatever you esteem yourself to be, my friend, that's a pretty low aspiration. So find your worth in what God values you at. Is that a help? We teach people all the time to believe in themselves. We need people just to believe in Jesus. Believe in God's love. You question whether or not you're worthy or you're worthwhile or you're lovable. God loves you. Does anyone else matter with comparison to that? You know, there are many young people that grow up not being loved by people that ought to love them. No young person has ever grown up without God loving them. Find your value, find your worth in this greatest place, not in the least of places. God loves you very much. Chapter 2 and verse 20, the Scripture says, Adam gave names to all the cattle, the fowl, the air, to every beast of the field, but for Adam was there not found in help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Now, I've heard a lot of clever things. You know, a woman was taken from the sight of man because she was not, you know, I've heard him say, she wasn't taken, the bone wasn't taken from his head or from, her, from his foot because she's his equal, you know, she's a, partner to him and all those things. Well, the Bible doesn't say any of that. Let's make neat, you know, little picture lessons. Sort of like last night in youth group. Last night in youth group, we had some funny teenagers. I mean, we're really being serious. But uh, they said some funny things. Christian uh, said that the reason that God in the wilderness was with the children of Israel uh, by day as a, as a cloud and by night as a pillar of fire is in the day they could be cool and at night they could be warm. And I reckon there's some truth to that, but the real reason is because that was the presence of God. And if God's, if God had been veiled in a cloud or in a fire, it would have killed them all. So uh, it was symbolic, not just symbolic, but God's presence uh, was there. What did that have to do with anything? Oh, just talking about neat things that people come up with that aren't the point. The point of how God made the woman in verse... 23 is made in chapter 1 and verse 26, and we find it actually in 26 and 27 in the pronouns. Verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then, and let them, you see the pronoun there? Them is singular or plural? Singular or plural? Plural, plural meaning man is mankind, right? And then in verse... 27, them is specifically defined. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And so whom did God breathe into their nostrils the breath of life, man or woman? Yes. Both are made in the image of God. It's not one that's, well, man was made first and so he's greater. No. Man and woman are made in the image of God them. Mankind is referred to as man and woman, them. So man and woman are made in the image of God. What do we find? Well, we find equality. We find total equality. We don't find, you know, God made man and then as an afterthought he added a servant. <coughs> God made man, he made them, man and woman. That's how the Bible puts it. You see it? Okay. There, there's a point that leads to our specific point this evening, and I want to read it in uh, Galatians. If you go to Galatians with me, chapter 3, again, I think that, that if you'll hang in with me for just a minute, and if you, will, if you will glean the truth that I'm pulling from its context, not out of context, but the truth that just having stand alone in its context this evening in chapter 3, this is where we learn about the purpose of the law and that salvation is by faith without the works or deeds of the law. In that passage of Scripture where the purpose of the law is defined, chapter 3 of Galatians, the Bible says, let's just look at verse 25, uh, or verse 26, For ye are all the children of God 
by faith in Christ Jesus. But for as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We find that God made man in His image, male and female, created He them. There's a lot between Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 1 and Galatians. There's a lot of things that have transpired, are there not? Several dispensations have, have happened. We see in Galatians, though, that God has always been the same. And salvation has always been the same. God's plan has always been the same. His relationship has always been the same. And we find that the Scripture says in verse 26, For ye are all the children of God, and the qualification for that is by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, you've heard this, we're all God's children. You've heard somebody say that? When I talk about religion, you know, and you have the, you know, the coexist sticker that has all the you know, amalgamation of some of the thousands of religions uh, in it. And it says, coexist. And those people would say, we're all God's children. We're not, actually. The Scripture says, in Christ Jesus. We're all God's children in Christ Jesus. So if you have looked to the cross of Jesus, of our Savior, and if you received Christ as your Savior, you're God's child and we all are. We all are. And as such, the Bible says then, there is neither male nor female. There are neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, man, male or female, is made in the image of God. Man, redeemed through Christ, male or female, is God's child. And now I just want to get really, really practical. That, that's just a doctrinal fact. In Christ, the Bible says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. I, I've really enjoyed Matthew, haven't you? The genealogies in Matthew with all the interjections of people that shouldn't belong in the lineage of Christ. Rahab, Tamar, Ruth, I mean Bathsheba. People that shouldn't have been in the lineage of Christ, honestly. And yet God included them. Why? Well, because of Jesus. And legitimately so. Their faith, ultimately, is what qualified them. Have you ever wonder why you think it was political aspirations? Just this is an aside. You think it was political aspirations that made Bathsheba want Solomon to be the king because of David's promise? Or do you think there may have been a little more to that? Do you think that she may have been like Jacob when he wanted the birthright? Do you think Jacob's birthright that he wanted was possessions? Or was it the promise? It was the promise, wasn't it? Do you think Bathsheba wanted to be the mother of the king of Israel? I think God knows the ultimate answer to that, but I think it was more than that. I think that the covenant that God made with David meant something to Bathsheba. She desired that. The Scripture says expressly that in Jesus Christ we're all one. Friend, if there's anything in the world that ought to unify people, being one ought to unify them. And I just want to talk really practical for a minute because my heart is grieving right now over how much of a division is being forced on people. A lot of it's in America, but a lot of it's worldwide. That tries to put us and them pronouns instead of us. In other words, inclusive and exclusive. I can't write a long enough paragraph on social media to deal with 
the forced racism. To give a perspective on it. But I'll just tell you, it just grieves my heart, just breaks my heart. It is so difficult, is it not, to begin any dialogue with a perspective of it's me against you. That's the hardest thing about it, isn't it? Just being real. The toughest thing about it is that you're invalidated because of differences. Quote. That's where the argument begins, doesn't it? White versus black. Male versus female. And whatever else. Us versus them. And I just want to tell you something. From the world's perspective, I have no answer for it. I don't have an answer from the world's perspective. It grieves my heart. It's wrong. And it's going to get a lot worse if the thinking continues to go along the lines of us versus them. You know, it's pretty neat having Brother Andrew here from South Africa a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things he told me, he said, what's so neat about America is we don't have, you don't have racism. And this is the week that the football players took a knee. He said, it's not racism. Go to South Africa sometime. So you don't have a problem with race in America. And you know he's true. If you check out African history, what he's saying is actually true. Used to be, it used to be in South Africa that you didn't kill somebody for being the opposite color of their skin, but you do now. I mean, literally, the distrust and the angst between blacks and whites in South America it is so dangerous that a white man cannot speak to a black man and vice versa. That's how it is in South Africa. Nelson Mandela helped a lot with that. Great socialists bringing people together. It's lies. And all those lies begin actually at creation. And those lies began by saying that we were created different instead of in the image of God. My friend, I just want to tell you something. Paul said to the church at Galatia that was struggling over their ethnic differences between Jews and Greeks, he said in Christ Jesus there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. We're one in Jesus Christ. Melanin makes no difference regarding relation when we come from the same race. Every single person has a degree of prejudice in them. Everybody does. Every person, I've never met a person without prejudice. I have not. I'm speaking specifically about you. Some of y'all won't eat possum. See what I'm saying? Some of y'all don't even eat meat. And I have a strong prejudice against that. Not eating meat. To some degree, every one of us has an opinion that says, I'm right, and you're wrong, and not only are you wrong, but you're different, and so... I have an aversion or a dis lack of comfort with you. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine being a saved Pharisee when the Gentiles got in the church. Can you imagine having a feast with Gentiles? I don't like using that drinking fountain after some of you all. I'm just telling you, just as you're, you, you have concepts of sanitation, and they don't. Just that. I mean, it's, ugh, you have an aversion to it. And so we all have prejudice, don't we? We do. When we're faced with concepts or a worldview that's different, than the one we are accustomed to, have grown up, and the only one we know, we're prejudiced against it. Actually. Europeans don't use toilet paper. They're disgusting. <laughs> That's a random... I've never been to Europe. They may have toilet paper there, but I've heard they don't. 
Southeast Asia does. Southeast Asia does or doesn't? No, it doesn't. Okay, yeah. Southeast Asians don't have toilet paper. A lot of the Middle East. All right, Charlie, that's enough. <laughs> God didn't create people to be us and them. God created us to be family. We're creating His image. He didn't create people to be, you know, I'm male, I'm better. I'm female, I'm better. He created us to be in His image. And it's an absolute godless concept for people to be divided when they're God's children. Fact. For years, I have felt as though the root of the, at least the answer to the tension is for our churches to get the straight of it. For us to see souls the way God does. It's fine to target a people group from a practical level. We target people for neighborhoods, try to reach particular neighborhoods, usually based on proximity, sometimes on response. And those neighborhoods oftentimes have a people group within them. That's fine. But you know where it's really evil is when you exclude others. First time I ever ran into that was when I was in college and there was a fellow that was kind of get, going to seed a little bit. He was Jewish, and he wanted to get do the Aliyah and go back to Israel. And uh, he considered himself, you know, in Jewish ministry. And he was always talking about he would take the phrase in the Scripture to the Jew first, to the Jew first. And he never wanted to talk about it also to the Greek. That part of the of the Scripture didn't belong to the Jew first, to the Jew first. And he'd say, if the Jews aren't all saved, if the Jews haven't all heard. The Gentiles shouldn't be hearing the gospel yet. To the Jew first. To the Jew first. To the Jew first. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. The Bible expressly states so. I'm frustrated sometimes with ministries that focus on Jewish missions. Because I think, well, that's great. We ought, to, we ought to reach the Jews. We ought to go to Israel or we ought to go to locales where Jewish people are and we ought to reach everybody there. Many as people as, as are there, as many people will hear the gospel. We ought to preach the gospel to them. But we divide our churches up. We have Hispanic churches. We have black churches. We have white churches. God isn't black or white. We're made in God's image. If you're made in God's image and that's the color of your skin or the tone or the shade of your skin... You're made in God's image the same way I am. Period. And tragically, the church has gotten it wrong many times. There are Baptist groups that have missions to black America. That's nonsense to me. Why would you have a preacher that's going to start a black church? You know why? So save black people won't come to your church. And that's a fact. Say, Pastor, you don't know the hearts of every person. No, I just know what people do. I just know what people say. And the motive for having a black church is so that you keep the blacks with the blacks and you keep the whites with the whites. I've gone to black church before. I've been there. <laughs> it's okay to visit, but you ain't staying. Because this is black church. We don't need to bring no whiteness in here. I'm serious. I'm serious. 
I'm not, I'm not making that up. That's the mindset. It's the thought behind it. And that, my friend, divides. It does not unite. It divides because it concocts or creates a difference or a division that's non-existent. There's no difference between Jew or Greek, male or female, bond or free. There's no difference. And I don't have an answer for anybody that believes in a non-existent difference. How can you have a discussion with somebody about something that does not exist? Difference. You say, Pastor, you said there's prejudice. There is. <laughs> about perceived difference. But I'm just telling you, a soul's a soul. That's what the Bible says. We're made in the image of God. So there's no difference. And I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that if there's one place in the world where people understand the truth and actually get it right and actually give a refreshing answer, that it would be a place that preaches the Gospel and preaches Jesus who makes us one. And friend, that's the simple conclusion. You can take all kinds of problems and simplify them and people get so frustrated because they say you're oversimplifying. You know, there is no such thing as oversimplifying. I found that out. There is such thing as overcomplicating, but there is not a such thing as oversimplification. You deal with somebody whose life's a wreck. I do oftentimes have people come to me, their life's a mess. And if you say, if you're, if you're bold enough to say, tell me all your problems, wow. I mean, it's so complicated that this problem, if it were solved, would create a problem for this problem. And if this one were solved, it would cause a problem here. And all the problems, I mean, it's just so convoluted and it's so messed up. It's just like, whoa, that's, that's not a problem. You just like, it's a mass of problems. And the answer to it is Jesus. <laughs> you know why a Christian has struggles with addiction, with depression, with and you can just go on and on and on and on and on about all the problems people have? You say, Pastor, because they don't have the right medication. Well, I don't know what the right medication is, but I'll tell you this. Usually it starts with the heart of rebellion. A Christian who just is not willing to do things God's way. That's where it all starts. And you can get yourself in a pile it's an absolute pile of problems, a pile of messes, but it all starts usually with one wrong attitude. And this creates this, and this creates this, and this creates this, and it's like one of those Jenga piles where you get a big tall stack and if you pull out this piece, everything collapses. But you know you can oversimplify it? The Scripture actually does. You know what it says for believers? Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Pastor, it's oversimplification. Man, it's good to be simple. If I do right, then this will happen. Just do right. And you can trust God with what will happen. I'm telling you, oversimplification is what we actually need. We've got a lot of problems, don't we? This whole NFL thing, it's a problem, isn't it? It's, it? it's not going away. You know, two boycotts or three boycotts or whatever is not going to make the, the hatred and the divide go away, is it? You think? There is irreparable damage outside of forgiveness. Uh, the wedge that's been driven is so massive that it's not going to happen. Listen, let's just be straight up about it. It is not about Donald Trump. Is it? Is it about Donald Trump? Are people kneeling 
for our national anthem because of Donald Trump. Trump. It, yeah, it happened before Trump, didn't it? What'd you say, brother? Kind of. He spoke up. Yeah, he pushed buttons. Yeah, yeah. He pushed buttons. Let me say this. It's not about cops. It's not about cops. There are corrupt cops. And the national anthem and disrespecting it, and I'm sorry, disrespect kneeling during the national anthem instead of saluting it is disrespect. And I know that some people never actually learned how to respect the flag in America. And again, I'm talking America. God's not an American. I'm just, we're talking issues here. I think we should. Okay? Disrespecting the flag has nothing to do with corrupt cops. If you want to do something about corruption with the police, then we have a lot of recourse, actually. There are individuals who have the ear of people like Colin Kaepernick and his friends. Those individuals could go to any police station in town and literally cause such a stink that the department would be turned on its head. If they said, I'm going to go protest, in, I'm in Fort Lauderdale isn't involved in this, by the way, but I'm going to go to the Fort Lauderdale Police Department and protest corruption because of unfairness and, and corrupt treatment. And Colin Kaepernick did that, the press would show up. Attorneys would show up, wouldn't they? Listen, if you beat up innocent people and I wasn't too busy, I'd show up. Serious. And I'm saying if I weren't too busy, it'd have to be a priority in my life. I can't go everywhere and protest everything that's evil or that's wrong. I'm serious. I got beat up when I was a teenager by cops. When I was a teenager, 16 years old, I'm driving a Yugo. It's raining, it rained 13 inches that night. I'm driving a Yugo home and I got pulled over by a cop that followed me out of the parking lot, knew where I was coming from, knew where I was going. I had my Brahms uniform on and my hat on. And he stopped me, made up things. He said, your headlights are out, taillights are out. Dragged me out of the pavement, ripped my clothes, tore my kneecap, put his knee in my back, put the cuffs on me. A bunch of other cops came, threw me on the hood of the car, threw me on the ground, threw me in the car. Took an hour for them to figure out they'd made a mistake. They thought my, our, my car was stolen because we'd had another car stolen with a different tag from our car dealership, my dad's car dealership. And when that happened... When they found out it was stolen, they began inspecting my car, trying to find anything they could wrong with it so they could justify detaining me and beating me up. Finally, I said some magic words, like, I think you're just harassing me. And they said, you can go home. But I was afraid to go home because I was late going home. And if you lived in my household and you were late going home, you didn't do that. You didn't go home ever if you were late. So I said, you've got to call my mom. Tell her what happened. And they said, no, you just go home and explain it. I said, no, -uh. <laughs> you got to call my mom. And so they did. They called my mom and she laughed at them. She thought it was funny. She said, oh, you think he'd steal it? You go. <laughs> and then uh, when I got home, my mom wasn't very happy because my clothes were torn, my knee was cut, and I'd been beat up by cops. Why do those cops do that? I'll tell you why. I know what they were thinking. I was a teenager. And all teenagers are bad. And they're all thieves. And they all do drugs. And... If they get arrested, they're just going to be put right back out on the street and there's nothing you can do. The law has no recourse against teenagers. They're minors. And they're just going to do whatever they want to do. And so they figured that they would take justice into their hands and make me afraid to do wrong. So they beat me up. Problem was, I didn't do anything wrong. I have experienced so many stereotypes. The next summer, the cops, this is Salina, Kansas, by the way, small town, Salina, Kansas, the next summer, four nights in a row, the same police officer followed me out of my work. I was a manager at Taco Bell. And I, the four nights in a row, I was 17 at that time. I drove out of Taco Bell, and the police officer pulled in behind me and pulled me over. And he asked me, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. Where are you coming from? I've got my name tag on. I've got my apron on. I've got my Taco Bell hat on. And he watched me pull out of the parking lot. He watched me get in my truck and pull in the parking lot. And then he said, do you mind if I inspect your, if I search your vehicle? 
Well, if you refuse to search a vehicle, it's automatic arrest. And so I said, okay. He searched my vehicle, found nothing but maybe a few bullets. Why do you have bullets? Interrogated me about that. Why do you have it? Everybody in Kansas has ammo. <laughs> no place doesn't have ammo in Kansas in their vehicles. Okay, the next night, same cop, same time, same thing. Acted like he didn't know me, pulled me over. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? Do you mind if I search your vehicle? Four nights in a row, same cop, pulled me over. And acted like it never happened before. I showed him a Polaroid on the fourth night of another cop smoking weed. Back then it used to be bad. So I got, I, I got a friend who's a cop. I showed him the uh, picture of that and he just stopped pulling me over. He didn't pull me over after that. That's corruption, isn't it? I mean, honestly, that's a police department that is harassing people. It's messing with people. That's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem for teenagers. You know, there are problems because there are sinners in this world and, they, and there, it's, there's a problem. And you know, when somebody overreaches authority and there's, a, there's an appropriate recourse for it, why, would we, why wouldn't we do something about it? The truth of the matter is, if it were my, one of my teenagers and that happened to them as a pastor, I'd go speak to the chief of police or the sheriff or whoever it were. And if I had no help there, I'd speak to, I'd do something about it. Not because I hate authority, because honestly, in Broward County and in, in uh, the, the sheriffs and the police officers and so forth, I've had nothing but pretty great experiences, except they don't show up when you call them. But as far as one-to-one -one experiences, when they do show up, I've had nothing but fantastic experiences with our law enforcement. doesn't seem to be a problem around here. I know there are a few bad eggs anywhere you go, but it just doesn't seem to be a problem. It was, in my hometown, our whole entire police department was corrupt. All of it was. And that's real life. That exists. If there had been more black people, there would have been a lot more racism in that police department. We just didn't have any black people. Being serious. We just had teenagers. And that's what they were prejudiced against. It is also wrong to disrespect authority ever. Isn't it? If you resist arrest and you get beat up, you deserved it. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. If you fight the cops and you get whooped, and you will, they'll just keep piling on until you get beat up. You're going to get beat up. It's going to happen and it's your fault. If you run from the police and endanger lives and make them mad and get them all jacked up on adrenaline so they're acting out of character, it's your fault. Last year, uh, Melissa and I were driving through the post office and this guy came trucking through the bushes full speed. And as he ran through the bushes, I rolled down the window and said what I usually do, hey buddy, or what I yell, stop. I yelled stop, right? And he didn't stop. He just kept booking it. So then I knew like, Okay, she, Melissa said he's running from the police. So I rolled down the window. I'm like, stop! He didn't stop. He saw me and ran faster. <laughs> so then a sheriff comes huffing through the bushes. <laughs> so I pulled up to him. I said, you need a ride? He's like, ah, he jumps in the car. We take off the doors lock. Gunk, he's in my back seat. <laughs> he's trying to talk on his radio, but he's too winded. We chase the guy down through the park the post office and he runs through the hedges into uh, the Shell gas station. And so I said, you want me to get him? And he said, yes. So I took off to go get the guy. So I'm chasing the guy and I get him cornered behind the dumpster and I'm about to grab the guy and another police car comes up and a cop jumps out and he pulls his Glock and he's on me. He draws down on me. And he said, get on the ground. And you know what I did? I laid down flat. That's what I did. And you know, he should not have pointed his gun at me. Except he was all amped up on adrenaline. And you know, a guy about this tall looked like a guy about my size. A guy wearing shorts and a t-shirt looked like a guy wearing, you know, a dress shirt and khakis. <laughs> a guy with dark skin looked like a guy with light skin. And he pulled a gun on me. And so I laid on the ground. And the cop that was in the car came around the corner. He's like, not him! And the guy says, well, where is he? And I said, there he goes. 
And, uh, oh, and so I took off again. <laughs> and I, let him, I said, you want me to get him? Yeah. So I went and caught the guy. Another guy, cop came up. And guess what happened to the guy that was running? They came up, and the first cop, I had him against the fence. I had him just trapped there. I'm like, stay right there. Don't you move. And the other cop drives up, runs his car into the fence right beside the guy like he's going to hit him, and then pulls alongside and then opens his door at the guy, hits him with his door, bam, and then threw him on the ground, put the knee in the back, and did the whole arrest thing. He got roughed up a little bit. I don't know why he didn't call me to be a witness. <laughs> but that cop pulled his gun on me, and I was innocent. I was trying to help the police, and he pulled a gun on me. You should never pull a gun on anybody. Here's another one. <laughs> Our condo in Oakland Park, uh, on Oakland Park Boulevard. The police used to do traffic stops, and then people, instead of stopping on the road, would pull into our condo, and our window was right by the gate. And they would stop literally right next to our window. Well, one night I'm sitting in my living room in my chair, and I look out, and a guy stopped, you know, blue lights flashing, you know, my, my condo's lit up with a guy, like, literally, oh, from me to Timothy, you know, away. And then next thing I know, there's a police officer pointing a gun at me in my living room. He's pointing a gun at that guy, but I'm the backdrop. And I called the sheriff and I said, you know something? I think it would be a good idea to try to wait until the car passes my driveway before you um, pull them over just so that I don't get a gun pointed at me in my living room. And the sheriff said, I told him to start off by saying I appreciate law enforcement. I appreciate the dangers that you go through and so forth. I'm just I'm not really complaining. I'm just asking for you to do something. And you know, the sergeant just started arguing with me. He's like, you say you support the cops. Well, if you support the police. So the next day I called his supervisor. And I said, this is the encounter. This is what happened. This is what happened last night. And I said, I would like you to visualize yourself in my situation. If you're sitting in your living room and someone were pointing a gun at you, how would you feel and what would you do? He said, I'd shoot him. I said, well, do you think it would be possible to speak to the sergeant and to the deputy about not doing that. And he said, of course. That's just common sense. He said, I can't believe they're doing something that stupid and I can't believe the way they responded to you. There's a recourse sometimes for things, isn't there? A couple of years ago, my interns were going through Oakland Park and this cop came and got out of line with our interns, told him he was going to arrest them for being in a neighborhood and they couldn't go door to door and da 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 and so I called a, a friend of mine who's an attorney, and I got some legal stuff, and I went down to the city. And I said, I'd like to meet with somebody, just have a conversation with them. And the guy that I met with, he said, they did what? They can't do that. Here's the, this is the da 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 And he called the, he called the um, I forget what the title of the head of, of Oakland Park Sheriffs are. But he called that guy, and that guy sent me an email, gave me a very nice call. He said, we're going to have an education meeting tomorrow, and we're going to fix all these problems. You know, that, that deputy didn't understand the law, and we're going to make sure all of our deputies understand the law, and we're going to deal with it. And you know, going the right way through the right channels, that's normally the response. There are some people that have hatred in their heart, and the fact of the matter is they're a problem, aren't they? The answer to the problem isn't to disrespect everybody else or make it everybody against them. You know, the truth of the matter is, is as a white American male, anybody I discuss the flag issue with, I start with the understanding that you're white and so we hate you. That's the way I feel. And I feel like I'm black and so you'll never understand and we'll never find common ground. And if I ask the practical question, what could I do? to make things right. What they say I could do makes no sense and it's not even possible. We just want to have a voice. We just want to be heard. Listen, my friend, I hear you. I've seen profiling so many times it's not even funny. It exists. I've been profiled. But that's not valid. Right? And so we have an issue created that has no answers if you don't believe in creation. And if God is not your Father, and if there are differences between God's children. The fact of the matter, my friend, is that there are no differences between God's children. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. And I'm happy to hear anything that you say, well, Pastor, you know you said this or you do this. And you know something? I say and do things sometimes that are insensitive and shouldn't. Sometimes I'm blunt because I want to communicate clearly, but sometimes I'm insensitive because I just don't get it. And you too. And as believers, we ought to treat each other with love, with decency, with respect. Again, with love though, with esteem. The Bible says, let us, every man, esteem one another better than themselves. That's a pretty good standard, is it not? If I look at you in regard to the investment that was made when Christ's blood was shed for you, I just look at you from the perspective of how much my God values you. I'll have a lot of respect for you. I'll value you a great deal. And vice versa. My friend, simplistically, that's the answer. What do we do about lost people, white lost people, who don't like white or black lost people or saved people? What do we do about them? Preach the gospel to them. Love them, even though they're unlovely. I can't stand, I can't stand the, the hate groups. I, I just, I would just tell you something, they make me sick. I just can't stand them. I have a very hard time with them. I can't stand, I know people that are just racist and I just have a very tough time with them. It's tough for me. Jesus died for them. That's where we find the common ground. So we preach the gospel to them. You know what will stop a guy from being racist? The gospel. That's the answer. So we can defend the flag. We can let people know our perspective. We can tell people where we're coming from and try to hear where they're coming from. But we won't find any common ground. We won't find any common ground that way. Because it starts with a world view that's just based on the opinion that we're all different. And differences, my friend, don't bring unity. As much as they try to brand that in um, cultural awareness classes. Sameness brings unity. And we're the same. We're made in the image of God. Male, female, Jew, Greek, bond, free. And so because of that, we have preached the gospel. Nothing demonstrates the love of God more than the gospel and the preaching of it. And that'll be the discussion. How does God save a white man? How does God save a black man? How does God save a teenager? How does God save an adult? Same way. By faith. You know, there'll be some kinks to work out. But if you come under the authority of the Scripture, it won't take long. You'll be loving each other. That's the answer. Okay? Uh, I'm going to finish with the word of prayer, but then Shamir wanted to join the church this evening. And normally we have folks join on Sunday mornings, but he didn't get, didn't get to this morning. And so we'll pray, and then we will um, hit him with a sword. Give him a minute. <laughs> Father, thank you this evening for the truth of the Scripture. And God, I pray that the bluntness and even the aggressive nature in which is preached would help us to see things clearly. We're made in Your image. We're trying to solve the problems of a non-existent difference is impossible. But preaching the Gospel is completely possible. And modeling Christ's love as a result of the work of your spouse is completely possible. And we're going to trust you for the faith to do it. Please give us a voice. Give us an answer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Shamir, come up here. 